Should I start? Okay. This is the session on DHS2 and PEPFAR. And let's get started. If other people wander in, they can join us in progress. We have three presentations in this session. Um, as you may know, DHIS2 is used in a PEPFAR. There's a, there's a main global instance that collects all kinds of, of data that's called datum. But DHIS2 apparently is used in many other ways in PEPFAR. And the papers we're going to hear uh, today, none of them are actually talking about data going into datum directly. So we're going to hear some other ways that DHIS2 is used in PEPFAR. The presentations will be by Lombe, who's going to talk about uh, a, the SAFE system from USAID, um, by Kayla, who's going to talk from FHI 360, who's going to talk about an EPIC DHIS2 system, and from Vlad and Alicia from ICF, who are going to talk about digital health inventory and how that's being used in DHIS2. So first we'll have a remote presentation. I'm sorry that Lombe couldn't be here in person, but uh, some visa problems presented that, but he will present virtually. So Lombe, you can go ahead and share your screen and start when ready. Okay, all right. thank you very much, uh, Jim. So let me just share my screen. And you let me know if you see it. Looks good. All right. Oh, that's, that's good. Good. Yeah. Uh, so my name is uh, Lombe Karima. I'm the Data Management and Strategic Information Advisor for the USAID SAFE project, uh, which is a project under JSI, which is John Snow uh, Inc., and being implemented in Zambia in uh, three regions of, uh, of Zambia. So the the abstract title mainly uh, focuses on uh, the, uh, the use of uh, customized apps in improving data collection and monitoring, as well as reporting into the into DATIM, which is uh, the paper system uh, that we're reporting into on a quarterly basis, semi-annual, and uh, on an annual basis. Yeah, so uh, just a brief overview of uh, the USAID self project. Uh, so uh, the USSF project is implemented, been implemented in three regions in Zambia. Uh, as you can see by the map there, there are shaded regions. There's the Northwestern Copper Belt and Central Province. And then I find that they, if you have to look at the main mandate of, uh, of the project is to, to reduce mortality, mobility, and transmission while improving nutrition outcomes and family plan integrations in the three regions. And the project life is uh, initially a five-year project, uh, which comes to an end this year, but we have an extension that's going up to 2024. And that's a period of implementation. And at the moment, we are supporting uh, 302 health facilities, which are in uh, uh, 24 districts in the three regions. And then of the 302 facilities, we do have uh, uh, the strategic information assistants, who we call, we can refer to also as data associates. So these are people that, uh, that handle the data facilities, as well as with the rest of the clinical team and other community, uh, community uh, health providers. So find uh, in these three regions. And then if you look, if you look at the, one of the mandates that we have amongst our objectives is uh, the 9595, which is a UN AIDS objective, where we are looking at 95% uh, of uh, our people to know their status out of those 95% should be put on treatment, should be initiated. And then out of, the, out of that, the 95% should actually be virally suppressed. So we work within the same UN, uh, UN heads of objectives. And then uh, at the facility itself, we just don't focus on one component. We look at different other aspects there, like cervical cancer. We do look at family planning. We also look at uh, uh, the pediatric uh, uh, cascades and uh, also support some of the community activities such as index testing, of which everything, when you put it up together, we need to go back to the 395s on, on testing, uh, initiation, as well as our, our suppression rates. So because of that, that's why we find that we do uh, all indicators are referenced by the MER. As you're all aware, most of us in the, in the house who are familiar with PEPFAR, 
PEFA does release uh, the motor evaluation and reporting reference guide every year, uh, somewhere by uh, September, October, some, somewhere there. So uh, this time around, we have revision 2.6, which was released in September of 2021. So we actually use the same indicators that are in the MER. Uh, that's the data that is collected from the health facilities by the teams, the, the MND team, as well as the clinical team. And then we do have some other custom indicators as well that are collected uh, on different intervals. So we do have uh, uh, indicators that are collected on a daily basis. We have some indicators collected on a weekly basis. We have some collected on a monthly basis, quarterly basis, and the semi-annual uh, basis. So depending on uh, what our reporting needs, we want to find that we do collect these indicators on uh, on those different uh, uh, defined uh, periods. So uh, as you've seen by the header, it's written GHIS to ECHO platform. Uh, so you can just give a, a, a brief background why, why the name ECHO, of course the platform is GHIS 2 uh, So ECHO, we were just looking at the bouncing back of, uh, the way it is that the name is ECHO, the bouncing back of sound. So we looked at it and thought of having a creative name uh, where instead of bouncing sound, we are bouncing back data. So when data is collected from the facility uh, using DHIS to aggregate it, analyze, it's bounced back to the, uh, the different providers who are at health facility, and as well as the other technical team or clinical, and everyone else who have an input in the data, and uh, we all now have to speak the same language. That's how we came up with it, um, ECHO, uh, to, yeah, to go our system. And then uh, uh, looking at the paper, MER, um, all PEFA supported uh, uh, IPs in the in the country and just people use the MER. So that's why we've also adopted uh, the MER for our reporting on uh, the different uh, indicators. Uh, so give you a bit brief background as well on uh, where we were uh, before migrating to DHS2 and how we used to do the reporting. Uh, so be before then, we were using uh, an offline system, we can call it. It's where data was being collected from uh, uh, the Excel template from the facility level. And then that Excel template is submitted to the district for aggregation. Then the same uh, tool, a different tool now is submitted to the province for aggregation uh, into one file. And then that file was then put into Microsoft Access. So we were using Microsoft Access as a transactional database. So I think it has to be used right there at the province. And then when all the cleaning is done, and then the province is uh, happy and comfortable with their data, that was now sent to the national office where aggregation was done into uh, SQL server, which we're using as, as a data warehouse at the time. And then um, depending on the different reports that we have, we'd have the quarter, uh, the daily reports, weekly, monthly, quarterly, and all those reports. So finally to have all of these different templates and all these different uh, uh, transactional databases as well, which would be sent uh, back and forth uh, the regions and the national office, and then also later on aggregated into, into one, into SQL Server. And then finally, when time came for reporting itself, which is the quota report uh, as one of the reporting um, periods that sell for paper, we would go back to SQL Server, and uh, pull this data around some queries. I pull the data into uh, into an Excel CSV file, which was later imported into Datim. But before that, uh, what we had done using uh, the Datim UIDs and the Datim codes that we got from the Exchange uh, platform, we actually mapped those codes into our SQL Server database. So it to be easy for us to actually get the import file that we can use for reporting into Datim. Uh, so we find that during this whole process of having the back and forth access, SQL Server, um, get a, 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 a dating file, we find that we would have this all back and forth, which was time consuming. We find that by the time you're getting a report from uh, uh, one of the regions, which is about 700 kilometers from the national office, uh, per adventure, there's, 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 there's then there's no proper internet connectivity at the time, you find that that file can actually be shared. Even if you try to share it through Google Drive, would have all those, those challenges. And then the process of all cleaning through all this from Excel to Access and Excel and uh, SQL Server was also proving to be a challenge at the time. And then uh, 
every time the mail is released uh, by September, we have to go back and update the, the, the new codes if the indicator has been dropped and find that that entire process of closing out some indicators, opening, opening up other indicators, changing the frequency of reporting and all that. We find that all, during that whole process, we find that we will lose out on time and have some errors here and there, the mappings won't be correct. And uh, some validations also miss out at the time of uh, doing the dating validation, uh, dating validation and the import. And um, when all that is done, the report had to be generated manually. So when you run the query for MSQL, we have this report in, uh, in, uh, in Excel, and then we start filtering out what we don't need uh, to come up with the import file that is needed for, for dating. And we find that at the time of doing that report, the entire process, because we only have a short window from the time we finish our data collection, which ends somewhere by the 10th of every month. And they, in the end, you have, we only have about two weeks to do the, the cleaning, the cleaning and all the aggregation and everything else before we put into that team. That's if you're doing the quarter report. So we were forced to work more we're extra hours. We we're forced to, to actually bring the meat that oil for us to make sure the data is clean because we do have a lot of data elements that we, what we collect as a project. Uh, Right now, if I was to go to DHIS2 and pull them, because we still maintain most of them, we've got over 600 data elements that would collect on a monthly basis. So I find that uh, as you are running through all those validations uh, using our SQL Server and our access, uh, time will be lost. And it was quite labor intensive. So I started at the time of reporting, when you're done with the actual, the actual reporting, you even uh, now have to. Uh, take a breather and take a few days off before you can reboot and get back to work. So with that, DHIS2 was then uh, uh, introduced to, to us in, uh, in JSI. It was there running with other projects, but that as, as a project, we now thought of migrating to DHIS2. And we thought of how, how are we going to improve our data collection, the entire aggregation, as well as uh, the importing tool into data. So we, we, we came up with our, our DHS2 instance, our visual echo, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, so this little diagram here is able to show us a few, let me see if we can get the laser to just point a few things Yeah. So right now, the way it is, at the facility level, so we do have this data entry person who's a strategic information assistant who does collect the data from the registers and the different DHR uh, systems at the health facility, and they enter directly into data. Sorry, they enter direct into, into ECHO, which is uh, our DHIS2. Then at the same time, they enter in that, we know we appreciate the, the, the good features that uh, DHIS2 has. Uh, the MD team who sit at the district level and the provincial level are able to see the data and they can quickly give feedback and they can easily run validations from there, provide feedback to the facility, and the, the team in the facility can also, now they can go back, correct the data, and, uh, and clean it right there such that at the time when they're done with their cleaning, uh, they can fuse them, see some visualizers, some reports to see how the data is sitting. And then we have some other now key stakeholders, technical team can also look at the data and see what's happening. So at the time everything is happening in collection, everyone is involved from the facility all the way to the national office. Uh, everyone will be able to see how the data is and run the validations and all that. So what we did to, to, make, our, to make our lives easy, we mapped all, our validations mimic the DATIM validations for most of the indicators, especially the ones that are paper indicators. They map the DATIM validation so that it's easy for us as we run the validation against the, the against DATIM and uh, important to DATIM find that it's, uh, it makes life easy. We actually send a clean file. So how did we achieve this as a project? So this is where I have this section here where we're showing the manage, for, uh, manage data for DATIM app. So this is an app uh, uh, that we have actually developed um, and embedded into, into GH, DHIS2. We call it the Manage for Dating app. So how, how we came about uh, setting up the app, we got the UIDs, uh, example for the organization units. We got all the codes from Dating as provided by the, 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 the Dating Exchange team and all that. We got all the, all the org units, IDs, and we got all the data elements uh, 
UIDs as well. And uh, we got all the category option combos, the way that team has actually, uh, the way they are set up in that team. Then we use those ones to map to our, our DHIS2 UIDs. So the indicator in, uh, in that team example, TX cards, the people that are currently on ART is mapped the same way in, uh, in, uh, in our echo as the people currently on, on, on ART. So we get the UID from there and we get the UID from, uh, from that team and then we, we reference those two. So that's how we manage to, to work around the, the manage for that team app. So to achieve this, uh, we are using, right now we're using version 2.36 and all the data is actually stored in the, in the data store. We don't have any external storage of data. So everything is from the data store and we're using the Python scripts to help us do the mapping from, um, and the mapping between the Datum UIDs and the Datum codes, as well as the, the, um, the echo uh, UIDs and the codes. So find that uh, after introducing this app, I can attest to this, the work that used to take one week for us to prepare the quarter report, like quarter three, quarter three has got very few indicators to take us about a week plus and all that. We're able to do that in like two to three days, maximum three days. That's if we're just taking our time, we're just working maybe six hours in a day or so. But if we try to push further, we us at least with nine hours in a day, we find that we're able to achieve that in two days and finish the entire quarter three report. For certain uh, uh, reporting periods for semi annual and annual, that's why we tend to reach about four days. So the period has just take two weeks. It now takes us about a week or so, five days, we are done with the reporting because life has been made easy. So all we do is just click the button and then see the mapping is done already in the background and all the validations are already configured in our, in our DHIS2. Based on that, thing, we pull out the data. And it will generate a CSV file that we now use to validate against that team and eventually uh, report the data into, into that team. So it's one of the things that has helped us, uh, the, the app customization, which has actually made life easy for us to map uh, the category, the category uh, combos. And every time there's a change in the MER now, we find that it's easy for us. We just go in, just change from the, from the front end, and then the indicator will be mapped differently. And also the manage for data, uh, the app actually allows for uh, data quality checks. We're able to run validations through the app itself. So we have about three intervals of validations. The form validations, we can run the actual data quality, and then we can run the validations as well from the app and uh, eventually run the validations into that team. And then we'll be able to then report the data into, we're able to report it into the that team dev uh, instance. and. Then, and the file eventually sent to that team support for that team upload. So what are some of the things that we have picked up that we can uh, call the results in the, uh, the results and conclusions is that uh, using DHIS2 and ECO in 300, 302 health facilities has actually made life easy for us when it comes to aggregation uh, analysis and reporting. That's like at facility level and all. And then on our, uh, on, on our end, when it comes to uh, that team reporting, we find that life has been made easy. Because before then, we were would assemble a team of about 30 from each region, 30, 40, bring them in one place, and start doing manual data entry. Uh, they would have to burn them in that or work one, two weeks to do the entries. But now we don't have to bring anyone in one central place. All we have to do is, wherever they are, they do their normal entry on a monthly basis. Then we just uh, run the app and the data is aggregated. Within a few minutes, we'll have the data already in that team. So found that uh, uh, the time has been reduced for about 50 to 60% when it comes to uh, running these, uh, preparing the data team uh, reports uh, from 10 days to about five, five days somewhere there. All that has been reduced just by using the app. And then the app also helps us to generate the reports that we need uh, depending on the frequency that we're reporting on. And then it also helps us to just submit an error-free report. Uh, or, and then um, the other thing that we can, we can appreciate about the app is we try to also to make it easy to help us report on uh, data outside data, such as the high-frequency reporting indicators HFR. So we're able to just 
Um, I'm sorry, sorry to interrupt. It's it's been more than fifteen minutes. Are you able to wrap up in a couple of sentences? Sure, not a problem. This, this is the last slide, I think. All right, sure. Uh, so we can say efficiency has improved the data quality. Yeah, that that uh, in, in the dustroom has actually improved our data quality. That's the use of the app. And yeah, like I said, this was my last slide. So yeah, so that, that's what I can say about, uh, about the apps in that it has greatly improved our work and it has made work easy for us as a project. And thank you. I didn't realize it was 15 minutes. Thank you, Lombe. Next up we have Kayla, who will talk to us about Epic system that FHI 360 has developed. Okay, well, while they're setting up the presentation, maybe I can just start by saying, uh, Lone Bay, please send us your app. We definitely want to use it. Um, it would definitely help our project as well. All right, that's good. We can, yeah, we can, we can chat over that. <laughs> Okay, great. So um, my name is Kayla Stankvitz. I'm a technical advisor in health informatics and data science at FHI 360. And today I'm going to be talking about our experience using DHIS2 in the EPIC project, which works in 65 countries. So um, honestly, you can take all the background from the previous presentation and just apply it to many, many, many countries. And it, um, it actually works well as background to our project as well. Okay, but just briefly, we are a five-year PEPFAR project um, supporting HIV and also COVID-19, and we're focused on key populations. So these are populations that are at higher risk of HIV. They might be female sex workers, men who have sex with men, people who inject drugs. Um, we also work in some generalized epidemic countries where we just support the general population. We support the full range of HIV services from testing, prevention, and treatment um, in over 30 countries. And more recently, we've started supporting COVID-19 vaccination and oxygen systems in over 40 countries. So that's where the 65 countries come, come in. Um, we work in some countries in both HIV and COVID. So um, the reporting burden for our EPIC supported sites is quite high. Um, many, of, many sites originally collected data on paper, and then they'd have to count up those numbers on a regular basis and report to Ministry of Health databases. They have to report monthly to our project database, which I'll talk a little bit about later. And then they would report quarterly to datum. So there was a very high data entry burden for us, for our staff. And um, through Epic, we've tried to improve the data reporting and utilization um, of the sites uh, that we work with. And DHIS2 has been a really integral part of that process. So um, we use DHIS2 tracker in I think 20 of our HIV countries now. And um, as I mentioned, both our project database and our funders database are also based in DHIS2 aggregate. Um, for DHIS2 tracker, we actually developed a, a metadata package that's available on our website that can be used for tracking um, all of the services that I mentioned here, or sorry, here from testing prevention to treatment. Um, I've given multiple hour long talks on that system, so I can't cover it in an hour, or sorry, I can't co cover it in 10 minutes, but uh, I'm very happy to chat with anyone about that if anyone's interested. So this is what our aggregate DHIS2 system looks like for the project. It's called InfoLink. Um, if anyone is familiar with datum, this looks a lot like datum, but what we do is we further disaggregate all of our data by population type. So 
if you think about datums reporting, I think maybe some people in the room know how burdensome it is to report quarterly to datum. Um, we have further disaggregated our data and we're reporting it monthly instead of quarterly. So this is a really, really big data entry burden for our teams, but enables us, us to have really good data that we can act on. And I just want to, this is mostly focused on HIV, but I want to briefly mention that maintaining a DHIS2 aggregate system at the project level has enabled us to very, very quickly adapt when we got um, COVID-19 buy-in. So we were able to very quickly use this platform to collect COVID data as well. So, um, as I mentioned, the reporting burden into InfoLink monthly is quite high. So we've actually used a tracker to aggregate data migration process um, to translate the data from our 20 tracker countries into the aggregate data model, data format to report into InfoLink. I think if you're particularly interested in tracker to aggregate, you're probably not in this room because there's a session about this going on right now, but... Um, I'm happy to talk about this process that we use as well. And I'm really excited to hear that, um, that this is being integrated into DHIS2 going forward. So um, the main thing I wanna talk about is how we actually um, automate our reporting in the project and how this has enabled us to improve data quality and um, consistency of our reporting to our funder. So we do this um, using Power BI. So the, the challenge was that um, each of our countries that work in HIV, which as of right now, that's 34 countries, has to submit quarterly reporting slides to PEPAR. Um, they have to generate these on a quarterly basis and the quality of these slides kind of varied across countries. Some countries had a lot of capacity to generate uh, graphs and visuals, some had lower capacity, but um, there was also nothing preventing them from entering different data than what they were reporting to InfoLink. So they could report to InfoLink and say that they tested a thousand people, and then they could write in their quarterly reporting slides that they tested 800, and there's, there was nothing to autom automatically flag that as an issue. So what we did was we generate, we actually automated the reporting process via DHIS2 and Power BI. So we utilized the DHIS2 API to um, create what is technically a Power BI dashboard, but we export that dashboard to PowerPoint and it automatically generates about a hundred quarterly reporting slides for each of our countries. So um, there are multiple benefits to this process. One of them being that we have one source for all data. So now any, if you want to use the automatically generated slides, you have to enter your data into InfoLink and you have to enter it correctly. So it actually motivates people to enter their data on a more timely basis and to correct their data entry. It also really reduces the reporting burden so people don't have to manually create their slides every quarter. And it has increased the quality and consistency of visuals across the project. So this is just an example of what that dashboard looks like. So when one of our teams logs in, they have to enter information such as the country they want to report for, um, the quarter they're reporting for, and which population types they want to highlight in the slides. And then um, the system actually automatically generates 100 slides. So it's as easy, so all the slides will show here along the left, and it's as easy as pressing export to PowerPoint to get your slides in a PowerPoint format. This is an example of a slide that's actually not showing any data. It's just a um, title page for the PowerPoint presentation. But here are some examples of what some of our slides look like. So this is an example of um, the cumulative cascade showing our performance towards targets. So we can see for some key PEPFAR indicators, what percentage of our targets we've hit and um, see a consistent dis, uh, graph across all of our countries in each of our QPR or quarterly reporting um, slide decks. 
here's just another example of a slide um, that again uh, shows the graphs that are automatically generated. So uh, lessons learned, DHIS2 has been a really effective platform for increasing timely access to data in our project. Um, we work across a lot of countries and DHIS2 has enabled us to um, get data from all of those countries in a timely manner and share it with the stakeholders that need that information. It's also enabled us to rapidly deploy information systems in uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the DHIS2 tracker to aggregate integration um, process is possible, but it's I, I haven't had a lot of time to talk about it today, but um, it hasn't been very simple for us to maintain, mainly because some of the things that the first presenter talked about, um, our funder updates our reporting requirements every year. So um, every year we have to go into 20 different DHIS2 instances and update all of that mapping. Um, so we're looking for better ways to kind of facilitate that. Um, and finally, DHIS2 and Power BI combined have greatly improved our ability to use our data, but um, we acknowledge that Power BI isn't a good solution for every country. Um, as a large international NGO, it works very well for us, but as we transition some of these systems to local ownership, we're really interested in similar open source solutions. So if anyone has any uh, experience with that, please feel free to reach out to me. Great, thank you. Thank you, Kayla. The final presentation will be from Vlad and Alicia who are working with ICF on digital health inventory. All right. Okay. All right. So, hello, everyone. So, my name is Alicia Smith, and my colleague and I will be presenting on a new initiative by PIFAR called the Digital Health Inventory. Um, as Kayla has gone through Epic a while ago, that's one of PIFAR funded projects. And this is one thing that PIFAR um, that will need to be inventoried. inventoried um, in the future once we have this tool available. So just a quick background of the why we're doing this tool. So um, one of the challenges or what PEFA is seeking to do is align their digital health strategies and they need to do that in order to have better health outcomes. And they can't do that because of, you know, data needs continually evolve. You know, with um, the pandemic, you see that we needed data for COVID just to see how we were responding. Um, there's different data formats and systems in their reporting countries. We've heard about interoperability issues, data use issues um, in a lot of the sessions that we had today. Um, there's a lot of problems with standardized of indicators on reporting. Um, as any person who is loaning, lending you money or giving you money, you need to have be accountable for how I'm, you're spending our money. So, you know, there's a high demand for accountability. Uh, there's high degree of fragmentation. Um, we realize that there are a lot of donors who are invested in the same um, digital systems, and it would be good if we have better coordination across these donors. And um, one of the things that we have heard on, on numerous occasions is we need to have granular data. That's the best way for us to have um, proper secondary use of data. And for per persons who work in the purpose space, you've heard Mark Gazela use this um, phrase a lot. We need to collect data once and use multiple times. So um, I've adopted, I'm not sure what's happening here. Okay, you can just pass on the computer. <laughs> I'm not sure what's happening here, but um, what we did was we, 
we looked at the principles of uh, donor alignment and kind of copied um, some of the the ideas or the mm -hmm. ideology from from that. And um, what we want to say is for what donor wants is they want to collaborate and align their uh, investments to the national digital health strategies. They want to prioritize their national um, planning uh, to just incorporate digital goods. A lot of the work that Perfor does is you know, focusing on digital um, goods or global goods. Um, we want to be able to determine and quantify long-term costs of any investments that we're investing in. Uh, we want to track investments, just look at the progress, the learning opportunities, successes of these investments. And we want to be able to strengthen donor technical skills as we just understand how each donor is, is um, investing into these uh, tools. So what donor will invest in? That's the next slide is um, we'll invest in things that are creating and um, just focusing on the national digital health strategies, policies, and regulatory frameworks. We're also looking at, um, you know, systems at an appropriate, okay, there we go. That's fine. All right, so um, when, when the slides are available, we can review this slide, but it's on the principles of donor alignment. Um, so what donor will invest in, again, anything that focuses on the creation and evolution of the country's national health strategies, policies, and regulatory framework. Um, we're also looking at systems that are you know, on the trajectory of and progress of um, continuing their health maturity level. Uh, looking at sustainable country capacity, uh, the focusing on governance implementation, uh, global good adaptation, and also digital help global goods that are sustainable, scalable, accessible, and again, the big word interoperable, um, uh, just to ensure that we're meeting those country priorities. And um, one of the things that we don't really focus mostly on is just the stakeholder sharing of information and ensuring that as a you know, global community, we are doing peer learning across these multiple systems that we're investing in. And that's one of the reasons, or those are multiple reasons why um, PEPFAR is launching the Digital Health Inventory Tool. Um, we're referring to it as DHI, not to be confused with DHIS2. Right, just a shortened version. Um, so this is a new data stream that has been outlined in the country operation plan um, in the F for FY22. Um, and what DHI aims to do is just help PEFA understand how these investments that they're you know putting their money in, um, how they can they're collecting data so these digital health can help us inform planning, align investments across donors, lower burden, and increase the usability of national digital health inventories, and also just identify ways that we can scale tools and just improve um, healthcare delivery. And again, going back, we're seeking to have better health outcomes. And one of the things that we, um, we've done so far with this tool is we, we've developed it and we have already piloted and have collaborated with several stakeholders, namely there's an IWG that we're working with. We're also working with WHO, the Gates Foundation, Global Fund, and then we have extensive um, feedback and you know, collaboration with multiple implementing partners, namely from Uganda, Vietnam, and Zimbabwe. So quickly, my colleague Vlad is just going to run through um, how we in implement this in DHIS2. And I just did the background. Thank you, Alicia. Um, and I recognize we have very little time left, so we'll just go through this quickly. And uh, I'm not going to have a lot of technical detail, unfortunately, because it will take a lot more time. So I'll just do an overview of how are we doing this. So we are doing DHS2, we are using DHS2, and so, um, you know, PEPFAR has datum, which basically is used for collecting most of the um, data streams that uh, PEPFAR uh, collects, uh, be it that MERS, SIMS, or anything else. So 
uh, all the users uh, have accounts. They know how to use the platform. So creating a new platform for a new data stream would be just not a good idea. So we were trying to figure out how to fit DHI with its complex qualitative questions into D, uh, DHIS2. Um, obviously, aggregate data format does not fit. Um, event and tracker didn't exactly meet our needs either because our questions were too complex and the requirements of how to display the forms was uh, a bit uh, complicated and convoluted as well. So. Um, we decided to go with a platform as a DHS2 where we would create a React application using the DHS2 um, library. However, we would use a, a AWS serverless platform on the back end for storing the data and processing the requests coming through this application. We still take advantage of DHS2 for user authentication, user authorizations. We use the data store uh, where we keep some of the information that is possible to store in the data store and then the rest of it is in AWS easily accessible. Uh, the system team working on uh, PEPFAR uh, systems, BAO mainly, is, uh, have been very helpful putting together the um, the tool set that allows this sort of throughput of the and connectivity to the AWS. Uh, so what this custom app does is basically you just log in into DHS2 and then you have this app but uh, it provides you with sort of alternate uh, form that you wouldn't be able to get through native DHIS2 data uh, types. Uh, we have custom data entry field types where we have um, the check boxes where you can select multiple with other, where you can extend it with uh, additional text associated with the other. Uh, there's radio buttons and there's this dynamic questions where if you select uh, a particular answer that um, uh, additional sub questions will appear. Uh, and then we do on the fly uh, logic uh, validation where um, we flag everything as you type, uh, as opposed to, you know, in um, data entry app, you would have to run the validation as you finish the uh, data entry. Uh, so what we've done is piloted this uh, to three countries. Um, and this three countries uh, provided over 30, uh, 80 entries. Uh, we've had follow-up focus groups with the three countries uh, and we've gathered feedback from them. Um, based on their feedback, we've uh, implemented the bug fixes. Uh, we enhanced the, enhanced the workflow um, and revised and expanded some questions to address the needs. Um, and then uh, based on that feedback, we have version 1.1 um, uh, and we're launching it actually on July 1st. It'll be launched to 23 priority countries in PEPFAR. But then PEFAR obviously has, uh, I believe, over 70 countries, and the rest of the countries are optional, where if they want to report it, they can, and it's just the, the priority countries are uh, required. Now, uh, of course, collecting data is one thing, but then how you use this data, you know, the, I think Jason Pickering likes to start with the back, where, you know, you start with the analysis question first, like, what do you do with this data? Because asking for the data is easy. So it'll allow us to facilitate alignment of the donor data and uh, investments. Uh, we'll be able to do the national inventories and landscape analysis of what's out there, because so far PEPFAR has not done anything like this, where they would ask questions like, what are the systems that we've invested in? Um, identify the scalable tools to uh, improve healthcare delivery and uh, improve the efficiency of programming and uh, reduce the redundancy of the inter digital interventions. Um, you know, it will let, let us articulate the uh, required digital functionality and uh, synthesize evidence and research. And then it will allow us to provide a regularly updated and broadly accessible uh, landscape analysis. And that is it. Uh, thank you very much. I tried to fit in. <laughs> nice. Thank you, everyone. Um, that's the end of the time for the session. Uh, if some of the presenters presenters might be able to stick around for a minute or two, I know I'm supposed to be somewhere else at 4:30. But thank you all for coming.